Today we will explore how technologies like VR, AR, and AI can help redirect your mind and life towards a healthier, happier, less stressed place. My co-pilot on this journey is Sid Desai, the co-founder and CEO of Novo Being, formerly Rocket VR, a company that uses VR to help people in hospitals or at home reduce their stress, find clarity, and feel their best. Hello, world. Greetings, avatars. Meet Sid Desai. Honestly, when I first look at what your company is doing, this therapeutic uh, use of VR, giving virtual reality nature and meditation experiences, et cetera, to hospital patients, particularly people with cancer, the first thing that comes to my mind is um, about a year ago, it's my mom. She, she had cancer and she was in a hospital room and... I'm just imagining that environment, you know, these walls, there's a lack of nature, there's lack of sunlight, lack of mobility. Um, she was spending a lot of time on her smartphone or uh, uh, talking through her iPad to us children. I'm, I mean, my, my last memory with her was uh, it was Mother's Day last year and all of us kids got together. Um, we each had our phones and she was there in her bed kind of half of trying to stay awake, holding her iPad. And I'm just, that while that was great, because we can connect, we had a chance to connect to our mother altogether, um, which we wouldn't have been able to do without uh, that kind of technology, that mobile technology. It's something sad about it too, that you're spending some of your last days uh, holding up an iPhone or an iPad or something in a hospital room. So I know ideally we would get outside and, be able to live in a, as the way we evolved and walk around and get the sunlight and look at the actual water and swim in the water and all of these things. But um, I'm looking at the VR experiences that you're giving uh, these patients and, you know, we can't always go outside and do all that. So I think, wow, these, these are beautiful things. Yeah. So can you talk about why that's my experience? That's sort of my, whoa. And that, that got me into starting this podcast too, is that Plus, um, my brother has mental health issues. He's been in hospitals, uh, other kinds of hospitals, um, homeless. And this all happened this past year, really. And that, that kind of woke me up. I'm like, oh, God, what am I doing? This matters. And also just going back to the U.S. and seeing people just um, in L.A. and uh, different places just kind of walking around like zombies sometimes. And not everybody, but I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is something something going on. And that kind of snapped me awake. And um, I'm wondering, like, what? What kind of led you down this whole path? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. And, and uh, you know, sorry to hear about your mom. You know, I think that must have been a terrible time when she was in the hospital and, and you guys were remotely communicating with her. Um, I've, I've been there in these situations and it's tough. Um, so I just wanted to say that. You know, Michael, what really got me into this is um, I've always been the kind of guy who likes to unlock the the inner workings of things so when i was a kid you know i used to like take apart my dad's uh cell phone and like the the, the rotary phones and you know like radios and television sets i just wanted to understand how these things worked on the inside like how is it that i can hear sounds from this box you know and and this curiosity to just kind of unpack and you know unscrew everything to explore the inner world of things really kind of what drove me into uh, in later half of my you know life to to really kind of focus on the human condition over time, I graduated i guess you know so called from electronics into understanding the human suffering and really kind of going deeper into that. What makes people do certain things in life? What makes people think? Why is it that they behave a certain way? Why is it that they feel a certain way? And I wanted to understand in in deeper sense really the reality of what it means to experience this life that we're, you know, we're all given. And so that really led me down to a path of like, you know, reading a ton of material about um, human performance and human brain specifically. And I love that, you know, you're a little bit of a brain geek as well, just like myself. I just kind of love understanding how the human brain works. It's, it's the most, you know, significantly used, you know, function, right. Of, of our, of our lives. It's our human brain. Right, I mean, you probably use your brain twenty four seven, three six five more than any other 
organ in our body. We probably use everything, but I think brains are like always on, always active. And so that's what really got me down this path of exploring the potential of like human brain and how can we, you know, um, deprogram certain things that we've kind of been programmed with a lot of times, you know, in, in our childhood and then live a fuller, better life. And uh, one of the events that really kind of shook me to the core that really got me into this path is my, my dad's passing due to cancer a few years ago. You know, he experienced a lot of suffering um, through that process. It was a five-year ordeal for him. And I witnessed what it means to, to suffer, right? I witnessed what it means to truly have fear. And I think that event really got me um, to a point where I started um, – to not feel so good after his passing. And I went through a, a, a depressive phase myself and I wanted to find answers, right? Being, being a solutions guy, being somebody who wants to unpack the human mind and understand how things work. I, I you know, did that for my, myself and started reading a ton of books. This time around, I picked up books on literal, literally mental health you know, topics. These are books that psychologists, therapists, psychiatrists would read books on cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, acceptance, commitment therapy, positive psychology. I wanted to understand what are these treatment modalities that therapists use and how can we take them and how can we make them more, more engaging? You know, So that's really what got me started with Rocket VR um, in, in 2020 uh, with the intent that we want to bring more immersive and engaging mental health interventions for anyone anywhere. Uh, you know, And my vision is we envision a, a world where mental health um, is not something, you know, that's, that's blocked access to. Everybody should have access to good and engaging mental well-being, um, just like everybody should have access to fresh air, you know. So I think, I think that world is going to come up about our way, uh, and we're just creating the technology to kind of support that. And virtual reality, at least the way it currently is, is mainly tapping into the visual sense and that's not coincidence. The visual um, part of our system, our nervous system, is one of the most powerful ways that we receive uh, we receive information, that we change our biology and everything. So can you talk about what you've learned about, um, can you talk about why the visual sense is so important and how by changing our visual environment, even if it is through what some might say is artificial through the virtual reality, how that can positively or negatively impact uh, everything inside of us. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, the, the, the visual sense, right? We all have these multiple senses with us, but the visual sense is the one that um, tends to be, in my opinion, at least, and, and I'm not a scientist, so I can't back this up with science just yet, but I feel like it's got the most highest uh, sort of bandwidth. We absorb a lot of information through our visual sense. Um, and I'm sure we do a lot of, you know, uh, absorb a lot of information through other senses too. But I feel like in my opinion, the visual sense is always like looking out, right? Because at the end of the day, as you mentioned, nervous system, it, it's it's the, the first piece of, you know, uh, I almost consider the nervous system to be an extension of the human body. It's like it's like It's like an existence of you outside of you. And this nervous system almost senses threat. And as soon as it senses, it, it senses threat, it goes into an activated state, right? Or a deactivated state. It's either it's hyperarousal or hypoarousal. So it's, it's fight or flight or it's freeze. And I feel like the visual sense that we all have plays a huge role in that because, you know, when you visually grasp or see something, it's not fitting the mental kind of patterns that you've already established in your brain your brain or your nervous system is better off to activate that threat response within you than to kind of not, you know, let that be active, right? It's, it's better safe than sorry. And I think nature created us this way. Natural selection as a process created us in a way that we should be looking out for threats. And it's not a bad thing because as I'm sure you know, when I'm crossing the streets or if I'm going out and about for a walk and the dog starts to chase me, I need that system to be activated. Um, but visually, you know, leveraging the, the visual sense in VR is quite interesting because, you know, when I put on the headset for the first time a few years ago, my brain didn't know the difference. My brain was like, oh, my God, this is 
this is real. Um, and the device that I had was not even the most high quality headset. But at that point, my brain was like, okay, there's something here and I can't, cannot step off the plank, right? I'm sure you know the plank, uh, you know, VR experience. Everybody's tried that pretty much at this point. And I could feel fear. I could feel like, no, I cannot step off this plank. And I think that to me was something, a switch flipped in my brain. I'm like, okay, human brain cannot comprehend the difference between what it sees through this headset versus what it sees in real life. And to be honest, the same thing kind of happens, you know, with our thoughts too, right? I mean, he, we all think so many thoughts throughout the day, what, 60, 70,000 thoughts throughout the day. And human brain has this innate capacity to visualize, right? We're able to visualize, you know, potential threats that might happen in our lives. Technically, what you're doing is you're kind of creating the simulation in your brain, right? Even though you're not seeing it visually, you're still creating it in your mind. Um, yeah, so I think for me, it's just fascinating that the VR technology and the technology of our time is, is, uh, was, is, was created in such a way that it can actually kind of, you know, tap into the same response uh, that we would, you know, tap into as, as if the situation or the event is happening in, in real life. And it has a lot of broader implications on society, both positive and negative, in my opinion. Uh, I'm leaning a little bit more on the positive side of things, but, but I'm sure there's, there's many implications about this uh, down the line for us. But yeah, what we see has such a powerful impact. Whether what we see is reality or not, that doesn't seem to really matter to our body as long as uh, it's adaptive and it uh, helps us live, helps us survive and all of that. I mean, um, I don't know if you know about this, but like back in the 90s, there was that guy in uh, Ramachandran in UC San Diego with the... Um, working with the phantom limb guys, the people who have yeah. phantom limbs. And Absolutely. there's this mirror box, right? And you, you, what one way to sort of um, relieve the pain from the phantom limbs, because usually it's a painful phantom limb. It's not just like a normal, yeah. our normal limb just dangling there, is you'd put the the remaining leg or arm or whatever in the box. And then you it would create the solution where the patient would uh, feel like, it would look like they had two legs. And that would... Uh, snap them out of yeah. it and relieve the pain. And that just shows, again, the power of this um, visual sense, even if it is an illusion. People say that's yeah. a good thing. And with VR, if you could do similar things with VR, say maybe, yeah, you are laying in a hospital bed, but you feel like you're floating through the sky or uh, just in a beautiful natural scene or something. That's a yeah. good thing. Yeah, and, and absolutely, right? And, I mean, ho hospital environments are very clinical, right? They're built... They were built that way. They're built for efficiency. I almost call hospitals as like Jiffy Lubes. You know, if you, if you know about Jiffy Lube, that's in America. It's like a car service station. They get your car in, you get the car serviced and get you out as quickly as possible. And hospitals incentivize to do that. They're not incentivized to kind of make things super comfortable for you, right? I mean, they don't want you to be there for too long. And I think that obviously that's that's a design issue, but more importantly, there's just so many sights and sounds around a hospital that your nervous system picks up on. And if you're, if you're in a hospital for, you know, 20, 30 days and your, and your nervous system's picking up all these threat signals, bom bombarding, right. Your nervous system with these threat, threat signals, it, it's gonna, it's gonna break you down. And so what if like, you know, we give these individuals the ability to, Put on a VR headset, just transport themselves, you know, to a beautiful nature-based location where they may or may not want to do any kind of therapy, but just if they just want to chill there for an hour, just listen to some music, you know, that itself can be pretty therapeutic. Uh, and what we're doing, you know, at, at Novo Being is we're actually taking clinically validated interventions and we're delivering them in a gamified format for these individuals so that while they're actually in these beautiful locations, um, they're not just practicing meditation and breath work. That is certainly part of the program, but they're also learning about how their human mind works, how the the connection between thoughts, feelings, and behaviors work, and you know how how can they cope with the, the stressors that they're experiencing, and how do you even register in your mind? How do you, how do you become aware of potential stressors that are impinging on you, and and um, how do you stop that cycle of automated behaviors, right? That a lot of us kind of almost engage in on a daily basis and, and put an end to those uh, disempowering cycles of, you know, thought, feeling, and behaviors, and then 
shift them into more empowered um, cycles of thought, feelings, and behaviors. So I think these are kind of things that we help people with as they're going through this um, intense hospitalization. Uh, and so far, you know, it's working well. I think hospitals are adopting a lot of this technology, uh, definitely in the U.S. I'm not sh- sure about other countries, but definitely in the U.S. And in the next few years, I mean, this is going to be the norm. I mean, the next decade, believe it or not, VR headsets are just going to be as uh, common as our cell phones are today. And everybody's going to have a mixed reality, you know, glasses, I guess, at that point, they'll be called uh, with them. And they'll be able to whip them out uh, and engage in a fully immersive experience if they wanted to, or potentially just engage in a mixed reality type experience that still allows them to see their actual room uh, and have these digital objects augment, uh, be augmented in that room. Um, so I, I'm pretty optimistic about this, the future of this technology, uh, especially uh, as it applies to its use in healthcare and mental health contexts. Right. And you talked earlier about how our how we can either be a, in a very sort of stressed state, uh, we can be in that fight, flight, uh, or uh, freeze, shutdown response, or we can be yep. in this sort of calm, more opened up, safe space. And it sounds like what you're trying to do is to, one, because you have, if you have cancer or you have some sort of serious condition that requires you to be in the hospital, you're probably in a pretty stressed out state in so many different ways. And not even not even just people in the hospital, people just walking around in modern everyday life. And so you're trying to shift people into that more calm, relaxed state. And I, it, for me, it's, uh, I mean, I haven't tried your content, but regardless of the content, I think there's something about the medium itself that is um, more relaxing and calming. Think about this. Um, and I talked about oh, with Amir from... Uh, uh, virtually, virtually. Yeah, 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 I was talking to him about this last time too. But uh, this is a sort, of, a sort of expansion of what we talked about there. With the smartphone, it's sort of this tiny screen, and you're just focused in on this little screen. It's very close up. Also, it's it's it's, a, it's uh, near you. When you're yeah. looking at things that are nearby you, your lenses in your actual eyes uh, tense up, and there's sort of a stress, and your it, it, it increase, increases things like adrenaline and cortisol and all of these things like that and you're not relaxed um but you're maybe uh, focused or something but but then when you look off into the distance for example look at things far away when you see the whole panoramic vision the horizon that uh relaxes your lens they flatten out your nervous system goes into more of a parasympathetic response where you're uh relaxed Things like serotonin and GABA start to increase. You're just, uh, I mean, think about when you're out in nature or when you just um, yeah. take a break from your phone and you look out at the window and you see the mountains. Hopefully you got a nice window like that and you just feel relaxed. And virtual reality, while the, the this these lenses are, I guess, technically right up in front of your eye, it doesn't feel that way. The way your body perceives it is as if all of this visual information from the virtual reality is like off there in the distance. Um Usually VR experiences aren't like creatures like up in your face and like things mm-hmm. punching you. Usually it's like a more um, big, wide, a wide place. Yeah. Unless you're playing a zombie game. So Yeah, no, we don't want to play that. But like we spent so much <laughs> of our time, um, especially this past uh, decade or so, in very nearsightedness in this myopia of being stuck to these, um, these screens that are really, really close to us. Not only are they close to us, they're they're not like a giant movie theater screen. They're this mm-hmm. tiny screen. So we're like angled in up close. And that is, I think having a lot of um, negative impacts on our health, on our biology, but also our psychology of um, making us feel more alone, making us feel more myopic yeah. and um, definitely stressing us out with virtual reality. Um, yeah. Unless you're playing these zombie experiences or something like that. Um, generally the medium itself, the way it's designed, it, opens you up and it relaxes you. And if you're on top of that, you're layering in uh, relaxing content uh, like meditation experiences or nature experiences, all the better. So can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. You know, cell phones are interesting, right? Like any kind of 2D screens, right? With tablets or cell phones or laptops, it doesn't matter. You're kind of just staring at it in a 2D world. 
And the reality is the human brain can still process 2D, you know, content in 2D form. There's no doubt about it because we're adaptable species. We're not 2D people. Like our brains are not 2D. Our brain doesn't think thoughts in 2D. Our brain doesn't just like stream information like a Facebook or LinkedIn or Instagram newsfeed in our minds. Everything about the human brain is 3D. And, and so I feel like, you know, we, we kind of, because the technology at that time when cell phones were invented, didn't have any other kind of choice but to just put this massive flat screen in front of us. Kind of like, you know, it reminds me a little bit of that QWERTY keyboard uh, case. Uh, did you know the QWERTY keyboard that we all use on a daily basis was not because of uh, superior design or anything like that? It's because the original keyboards, uh, if they had the keys next to each other too close by, they would get stuck. So the creators at that point decided to kind of split these keys across different areas of the keyboard so they don't get stuck. And now QWERTY keyboard has become a way of life for us. Everybody knows how to use it. Again, because the human species is an adaptable you know, species, we just adapt to stuff thrown at us. But I feel like the cell phone kind of did that to us. We just got, we got, we got used to you know, browsing content in 2D and, you know, interacting with content in 2D. And that user experience definitely got better over the years, not saying that, but it's still 2D and the human brain doesn't function in 2D. And I, so I feel like that's why, you know, this new immersive modality or medium of delivering content, it, it re resembles what true interaction in your real life can look like. If I want to go grab a bottle in VR, just like how I'm doing right now on my desk, my brain's going to know how to do that. And that's one of the craziest things that we saw when we first put our content into headsets and then had a few people try it out. And these were some you know, individuals in, in their 40s and 50s, sometimes even 60s or 70s, uh, right, in, in age. They intuitively picked up how to navigate. And that's the wonderful part about uh, user, you know, designing good user experiences in VR is when you design something that is so intuitive, that's almost like, oh, I got a There's a, there's a bottle here, or there's a glass here. There's a cup here. I can just pick it up and people just naturally just do that. So I feel like that to me is, is uh, this technology um, replicates a lot of, um, you know, uh, the, the ways uh, human brain functions, which is in, in 3D. So that's what kind of gets me excited. And I think there's all kinds of possibilities that will open up, not just in, in, in healthcare and mental health, but all the other use cases as well. Right. Because we, for 99, like 99% of our uh, human history of uh, our evolution, we were, we were living very differently. We were spending most of our time outdoors. Yeah. We, uh, we weren't, we were like I said before, we had this sort of big landscape in front of us. Yeah. We were moving. We were walking. Um, we had natural light exposure. All of these different things. And when we made uh, maybe the keyboard or the computer or the uh, smartphone, I don't know how much people were th uh, designing it with that evolved human self in mind uh, yeah. to try to match the existing technology that we've been uh that we already know automatically and it works and currently i'm not trying to bash on these uh phones and things but this is sort of clash between what inherently what innately we feel this is how the world works uh, we're given this other things like whoa, whoa, whoa this doesn't feel right um and so can you talk about some of the other ways i mentioned some things like movement and uh i don't know light exposure and all these other things can you talk more about that how how the virtual reality experiences that you're designing or vr in general taps into that natural way that natural environment that we're that we are used to as humans certainly i can definitely talk about that one of the first one of the examples i can give you is when somebody puts on a vr headset for the first time when you put them in the middle of the forest their natural instinct is to start walking especially if the forest like has a path without even a prompt they just want to they the first thing they do is they look around they explore the entire scene and then they start seeing they see, see a path and they start walking and that to me was fantastic and like because because again the, you know the human drive right is to explore the human drive is to as you said move 
to be outside, to breathe, to to just you know not exercise in the form of exercise, just like just be active, right? And spend a lot of time out there. And I think that's how we grew up until we started building these protective you know cases around us, which are houses. And of course, it's important, right? I mean, without houses, we I don't know how, where it would be as a civilization, but I, I do feel like, you know, some things got lost along the way. And I think um, the comfort that we all experience today in our homes and the comfort of our temperature controlled rooms and stuff came at a price. And I think uh, all these effects that you're seeing out in the world with the uh, obesity, you know, going up, uh, you know, all these like chronic conditions, um, a lot of chronic conditions, right, are, are all tied to lifestyle related issues. Um, so I do feel like, you know, when with this immersive technology, while we're not going to, you know, replicate exactly one to one what it what it feels like to be out in nature, what we can do is we can give you that feeling of ex that expanse that, OK, the entire world is potentially open to you right now. Sure, you can't walk in that world like you would normally do because um you can't just walk you can't have that big of a, a space to to walk around in in vr but there are companies that are designing these omnidirectional treadmills now so now guess what you know and the, the price points for these treadmills will continue to go down and at some point everybody will have one of these like treadmills in their own home that will allow them to put on a vr headset and literally just go for a walk in nature with a friend who is in another part of the world, maybe Japan, right? And I think that to me is exciting, um, just because I don't envision that we're gonna we're all gonna go go back to the way, you know, we used to live, which is in the forest, foraging fruits and vegetables and keeping our bodies active and moving, right? I, I think we're definitely gonna spend a lot more time at home. Um, but we can make the home design in such a way that it's conducive to our health, right? Uh, and I do believe that VR is one of the technologies that that can allow people to do that. And not just you know for people who are not um, experiencing any disease conditions and whatnot, but think about people who are immunocompromised, who can't literally leave their homes because you know they're just infected with something or they're just perpetually immunocompromised. With these individuals having access to the outside world, uh, even though if it's, if it's digital or immersive, can be such a blessing. Um, yeah, so that's kind of you know the future I, I look forward to. You were talking about these uh, these walls and the way now we're living in these buildings, which we think is just completely natural and normal. But for most of history, we did not live in uh, these four walls, and yeah. if we did have the four walls, they were they're probably more openings out into the world, and we probably just we didn't spend all day in there. We probably just slept in there or something how can vr technology aside how how can people redesign uh their homes or their work environment or their school or the hospital what are some of the ways that you think some simple ways some things that people can do to get these benefits of, of what all these things we're talking about mm. um with just simple behavioral changes um in their home or around their home or um, by redesigning it or any of that? What are some things that people can do? Yeah, I think one of the best things you can do is, and I think uh, uh, Andrew Huberman talks a lot about this, is just get some sunlight in the morning, right? Literally, when you wake up in the morning, open up the windows. Just get all that fresh, you know, uh, sunlight and, and bright light in into your home. Um, and, and sometimes, I think he even recommends it, literally go step outside and, and just, stare at the sun potentially with your eyes closed for like five minutes and and that's going to be deeply deeply rejuvenating for you because because we need that you know we're, we're we're pretty much like the trees out there we can't survive without the sun and i think a lot of people who are who live in the cities you know especially highly populated cities sometimes in buildings where, where there's another building around them like they don't even have access to direct sunlight uh, and so i think that's 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 the first thing i would do Second thing is, you know, try try to uh, add some, some plant some greenery in your space. Uh, you can see here I have one kind of tiny bonsai behind me. It's a fake, but again, it doesn't matter. I, I can't keep trees alive, but, you know, I, I, I can at least look at it. And that, that sense of green, you know, 
we're, we're again, naturally we're evolution has, um, baked into us this, this, uh, programming that, okay, green is good. Right. So, so like when you look at green trees and forests, it kind of soothes us. Um, and then, you know, other things just eat healthy, you know, stay active. Even, even if you're at home, try to stay active, you know, don't sit in one place for too long. Um, and and try and you know be be social like get out there talk to people go to the grocery store if you if you want to just buy a pack of spinach or whatever just interact with the per- person behind the cashier you know i think there's a lot of behavioral elements that are simple enough that everybody can engage in on a daily basis that um gives them these dividends you know uh in into their mental health um and i think a lot of us don't tend to do that because we're also just connected you know, on our computers and TV screens all day long. Yeah. And Andrew Huberman was also talking about how going back to that, getting the sunlight um, and everything involved with that is when we're spending, say, 30 minutes on our computer or on our phone to take little short breaks and go to the window and look out at the horizon. Because like, it's going back to our earlier point, when you're uh, you're tensed up on the screen, um, that's going to cause a lot of, uh, you're kind of retraining your brain and you're retraining your body to be in this sort of um, nearsightedness, this um, stressed out kind of uh, state. And so just by kind of resetting yourself and and looking out the window and ideally opening the window or actually going outside, that's going to help. So yeah, Andrew Huberman, he's a freaking gold mine. Huh. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I, it's like, I can't even listen to all these episodes because I'm like just busy taking notes every, the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is, I believe, believe it or not, there is uh, somebody whipped out some sort of a GPT plugin that literally tr- takes Andrew Huberman's podcast transcriptions and summarizes them for you. When I find the link, I'll send them to you. Okay. So, you know, uh, again, there's all these like efficiencies uh, or tools that people are building around. Uh, because, yeah, you're right. I mean, sometimes it's hard to just, you know, sit for like an hour, listen to a podcast uh, when I could just potentially get the summary. And then if I'm interested further, I can go deeper into that content. Another thing he talks about is uh, that I learned from him is a head position. It's very uh, obvious, but mm-hmm. when your head when your head is down, say when you're when you're falling asleep or when you're sad or you're feeling down, a lot of different things. Uh, your head's down, your eyes are kind of closed, but when your head's up, you wake up, and your eyes are open, you're awake. And we tend to associate um, positivity and feeling good. Uh, I'm adding this part in, but I'm sure he said it somewhere. I just didn't get to that episode. Uh, when you're standing tall, when you're looking up, this is kind of classic uh, public speaking kind of uh, advice yeah. and stuff, right? Or, but um, with VR, all of these things are naturally happening. So when we're on our phone or on our computer, usually we're looking down. And with VR, I know it wasn't designed for the purpose to, as a as a look up technology, but you can think of it as a technology, a little um, back straightener, a chin straightener, where it forces you to look up. Usually you're not looking down in VR. You're usually looking up and you're looking around. And how, my question is, how does head position and even just overall body posture, VR or VR aside, help improve uh, our mood, our biology, all of that? I think ultimately it's about, you know, kind of being in the most natural position. Um, in which you generally interact most with the world. As you rightfully said, most of us spend like eight hours, 10 hours sitting on a chair, staring at a computer screen on our chair. And and that movement, you know, kind of programs our, our bodies, right? In certain, in certain ways. And over time, your body's going to evolve to kind of, you know, be in that sort of slumped state. I think you've seen a lot of like memes of like these, these uh, ape memes where, you know, uh, it's like the, the ape kind of goes from four legged to two legged, you know, human, then eventually goes into the computer and like all like hunched down. And I think with VR, because you're kind of not in all cases, but in a lot of cases, because you're actually forced to get up and stand and interact and look around, right. Especially if you're playing a little bit of an active, um, game or, or engaging in an active experience that, um, you know, by, as you said, by default makes you want to like, look at, look, you know, straight, look, look straight up, right. And and stand straight and hold your position. 
And there's some fascinating like workout programs, right? And in VR too, right? That are out there. They're just phenomenal, right? There's Supernatural VR, FitXR. And I use some of them from time to time. Uh, I just sweat a lot. So I think the glasses fog up for me. But but I feel like for people who, who don't sweat as much, I feel like it could be one of the best ways to get a workout. And I remember uh, these workouts being very intense. So I feel like in certain cases, you can even make certain aspects of human activity a lot more fun, a lot more natural, uh, you know, uh, in, in VR. Uh, like think of, I think there's this one game where you're like chopping a bunch of wood, right? <laughs> it's a very, you know, very like rudimentary act but it's give, it's giving you movement and i think movement is key and i feel like vr technology can kind of recreate some of these even if it is in a digital setting um to get your body to move in in ways that it normally wants to move and that's another benefit of the use that you're uh giving to vr is these people who are when you're in a hospital you're immobile basically you're just laying there you don't even have the really freedom or permission to uh, walk around and move and that must be a bit um, freeing or uh, liberating for uh, people in there too even if you know they know that they're not really moving uh, even if it's just through a remote controller or something um, that it's, it's better than nothing and it, and it feels that must feel good and also um, we are all kind of disabled uh, or maybe that's not the right word we are all limited uh, in our capacities in some way uh, as humans we can't fly we can't uh, run at super speeds. We can't um, spend hours just swimming under the ocean or doing things like this. And I think another great thing about VR is it it shows you how limited you are as a human. And that's sort of um, relaxing and kind of a whoo, because we all have some problem. Maybe someone has a problem with their foot, uh, it hurts, and someone can't, uh, they're not, They their teacher told them they're stupid or something. It's so like, oh, I'm stupid. Or uh, they have cancer or whatever. And when you enter VR, you're like, we're all kind of not um, that physically um, gifted or that men- that mentally gifted. We can, we're all kind of just these creatures, uh, these mortals. And especially when you're dying or something, or you think you might be, you're going to, at least you think you're dying because you're in a hospital and they tell you, oh, you're, you've got six months or whatever. Uh when you enter this VR experience and you realize, oh, there's all this, there's this whole other world that beyond mm. this earth, beyond this mm. life I had, and there's a, uh, my body is uh, not all of reality. I'm kind of going off in two different directions here, but one direction is it's kind of relaxing you about your your own limitations and realizing, so what if I'm weak? We're all kind of weak in this way or that, but we can do things and we can use technologies to to feel better and maybe to get better and to reality itself this earth itself maybe there's this is just one little layer of reality too it's like a, like yeah. a lot of the buddhists say you know yeah and yeah. so maybe it's okay to die because maybe i'm just uh entering another reality and i think that might be a sort of beneficial use to all of this too um whether it's true or not i think by saying that huge range of possibilities that vr gives us it um detaches us a little bit from clinging to our our identity and our uh current reality it's like oh well so what who cares um yeah any ideas there yeah 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 i'm i'm a i'm a big uh buddhist uh you know fan not for the the religious parts of it but definitely for the framework part of it uh, there's a really good book that i recommend reading everybody for everybody it's called uh, why buddhism is true it's by richard richard wright really gives you a fantastic perspective on um you know just human life in general and really what drives us and i think Dude, a lot- i was reading that book today that's crazy. That's that is crazy. That that book, uh, I reread it. I start. I started reading it yesterday. That's awesome. Uh, I don't know why, and but it, why did I start reading that? I knew this interview was coming up, and there's something about I don't know why. I don't know why, but I thought this book might give me some fodder, some feed to yeah for conversation, and and I think it, it might have. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead though. It might have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's it's a fantastic book, and I think one of the one of the things the the author talks about in that book is really about perspective, right? Like we all have this human body and this human mind and we feel like, you know, the way 
our perspective is the only perspective that exists, right? Like my perspective, what I'm seeing through my eye is the only thing that's true and valid. And the reality is that is not true because, you know, when I'm looking at an object and if you're standing five feet away from me and looking at the same object, the way you're going to perceive that object is going to be totally different than the way I do, right? We might have the same representation of an object. Let's say I bring up this bottle in front of you right now. You're going to be like, oh, that's a, that's a bottle, right? That's, that's just your brain doing the computation to be like, okay, I've seen this before. It looks like a bottle. Therefore, it's a bottle, right? But what if it's a completely new object? Um, and think about the, you know, the, the author even goes beyond that. I think he even, I don't think if he mentions this, but I had this thought when I was reading this book. What about the perspective of other animals or, or birds? What if there's like a bird around, like right outside my window here? that's looking into what I'm doing. What about that bird's perspective? Is, is that bird's perspective not true? So the reality is, in my opinion, we live in a world of a billion perspectives. In fact, I correct that. We live in a world of infinite perspectives. And if you think that your perspective is the only truth, or if you, if you think that your group's perspective is the only truth, then you're very mistaken because you know you're you're looking at the world and the universe from a very limited perspective and i think that's what the buddha tried to preach the world that you know go go deeper go within and you'll understand that there the world is much more you know complex uh than you think and it's it's also much more simple than you think at the end of it so i feel like you know yeah vr has the ability as you mentioned to give people you know augment certain functions that they may not have, right? What if somebody who, uh, you know, has a disability and can't move suddenly wears a VR headset and is walking in VR, suddenly this person is going to feel so much liberated, right? Like, and I feel like it, it basically that technology now augmented that person's capacity to do things, right? So I feel like we can do a lot, a lot of that in VR, but at the same time, as I mentioned early on, there's also the other side to this, right? There's also the other side, which is now that we have, you know, this technology within our grasp to explore multiple potential perspectives out there, a lot of people might potentially forever be caught into just, you know, exploring and, and not really going anywhere, right? It's, it's, it's So I feel like I also have that fear that, you know, at the end of the day, having having that purpose and mission in your life and working toward that mission, I feel like becomes really important because if you're navigating the the world's consciousness without purpose, then you're basically just, uh, you know, you're just traveling, right? Uh, you know, you're not like, and you're learning, you're, you're absorbing, sure, but it's not being used or directed towards something that's larger than, than you. Um, but that's just my, my way of thinking about this. Yeah, and even the word avatar, I think it comes from Hinduism when when Vishnu came down to Earth or whatever, which he perceived as a virtual reality. This is not real. I'm going to go down there and jump on my avatar and go down there. Um, yeah. I might be wrong there, but something like that was going on. And uh, <laughs> so, and even now, like if you go into like uh, neuroscience and uh, the way the go into philosophy, we don't actually see the world around us. You know, it's sort of we get this sensory information and our brain interprets it like we hallucinate yeah yeah we're kind of hallucinating uh it's a yeah. uh, our brain is processing and packaging in this way that it looks like this cohesive world of objects and things and we're seeing it this way because that's the way we are built as humans but birds and dinosaurs and different things are going to see it differently and uh which one is reality which one is a uh, virtual reality so we're looking at vr now and saying oh this is this is not real so we're going to devalue it but like well, what's real about all this, yeah, right? You know, right. Um, and then beyond that, even we, like you, I think you're kind of hinting at, we have sort of these social, this sort of social reality around us, uh, cultural norms and rules and ways we have to live our life and what's important, uh, what's meaningful, all of that, and I think we do all kind of question it, but we do also take it to be reality, and this is the way things are. This is the way you live, and. VR can also 
kind of snap you out of that a bit in the same way that maybe reading philosophy or reading certain books of literature can help you be like, whoa, maybe I don't have to do that. Maybe I can do this. So um, just like now people are using ChatGPT or something to to get ideas or to get things done. I'm wondering about what about if we had like a VR kind of version of ChatGPT where it, it transports you to through all these possible lives and these possible realities and saying, hey, you can do this, you can do that, you can be this, maybe. And then you can find your own happiness. You can find your own path and think, oh, that's me. Yeah. This is the wor- the life I want. And that's another cool uh, potential use case of VR is to sort of uh, shatter our cultural assumptions that aren't serving us and also uh, redirecting our life in new ways. Yeah, yeah. I feel like humanity is hitting a point where maybe in the next five to 10 years, you will very much be able to design your life. You know, and what I mean by that is you're right. You're absolutely right when you say, like, you know, we're all going to have some sort of personal AI assistant that's beyond chat, right? Beyond um, the current ways of interacting. Um, I almost see it akin to, like, you know, let's think of like voice assistants like Alexa or Siri or all these like, you know, have you seen the movie her by the way, H E R. Yeah. And it's got a little, little AI, everything. Yeah. It's, it's basically, yeah. It's everything is like, everything is going to be driven by AI. The AI is going to know about your health. The AI is not going to know about, you know, what time you went to bed, what time you get up, you know, how many drinks you've had, right? Everything's going to be connected. And in certain cases, that's a very, in a, lot of, in a lot of cases, that's a pretty good thing because at the end of the day, you know, you can make better choices. If the AI can tell you that, you know, hey, and I think a lot of like uh, fitness apps do this a little bit today. Like, you know, if you didn't sleep well, if you consumed a little bit of, you know, alcohol the other day, or if you didn't eat well, sensors are going to tell you that, okay, you know, t- you're not quite ready today, Michael. You might want to take it a little bit easy. And I think there's this, a lot of smart watches are adding that functionality. There was a company here in Boston called Whoop that has a smart watch, fitness watch. Um, and it's fantastic. It's actually not a watch. It's a fitness tracker, but it's super uh, intuitive. I don't have one, but it actually tells you what your readiness score is going to be for tomorrow. So as soon as you wake up tomorrow morning, it's going to tell you, okay, hey, Michael, your readiness score is 90. That means you can go on. You, you, you slept well. You, you The resting heart rate was, was fantastic. And you can take on the day. You can take on Seven meetings if you want to, because you're going to be capable. The next day you get up, you're like, oh, hey, your readiness score, Michael, has dropped down to 60. Maybe take it a little bit easy. What, what Suddenly now add, add an AI layer around this. Think of what if an AI then decides that, okay, you know what, Michael, based on your readiness score, based on all these other parameters, I've actually moved these three meetings that were scheduled this afternoon because your readiness score is a little bit low. And you know what I've added instead? These two meditation sessions one in the morning for 10 minutes, one in the afternoon for like five minutes, you know, and you've kind of followed that regimen or follow that schedule. It's going to be better. It's going to perpetually direct you towards better and empowered states. But for an AI to do that, it needs a lot more information from you, right? About you, about your, you know, your sleep scores, your heart rate variability, your mood data, your food habits and everything. So it's going to need a lot of inputs. But when you have all these inputs that are being fed into it, it can create a very good personal assistant, in my opinion. Almost like if you've seen Iron Man, you've seen Jarvis. It's almost like you know that's pretty much the world that we're all going to be living in in the future. And and believe it or not, Jarvis is going to be available out there for everybody to subscribe to. I'm I'm gonna you know you and I in the next ten years are going to have like an AI personal assistant as a, as a service and we're going to, we're going to pay a monthly fee for it, having access to it. It's coming. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. That's beautiful. It's like the anti-advertising or it's like an advertiser that's trying to help us, not just help some company's bottom line. It's like, Hey, I'm trying to get you better. So do this. Uh, I'm going to try to get you better. So buy this. Um, and if I, I think there will still be other sort of um, things coming at us to try to redirect our lives in ways that may or may not serve us. But we have this buddy that's there for us. Uh, and because currently, uh, the way it is, is like, it's all on you. You got to read your books. You got to learn. Um, you got to sift through all this data yourself and have the discipline and self-awareness and all that. And that's all great, but it's a lot of work and it's difficult for some people. So 
yeah, maybe people will get a little bit less taken advantage of and they'll have a little bit more uh, autonomy and control over their lives, hopefully. That's, that's really yeah, exciting. Yeah, absolutely, right? I mean, if you think about it, you, you rightfully mentioned that right now the way a lot of marketing works is, you know, companies try to sell you into a concept, right? Uh, I remember the time when I used to eat uh, cereal, breakfast cereal in the morning, right? Pretty much every day without fail. It was healthy. Because <laughs> it, was, it was marketed to me as healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Where only later on that I learned that it's got a ton of stuff in there, ingredients in there that are really not good for you. And so I do not eat cereal at all, right? I mean, now and then I feel like it. I would, you know, get a box, but but I used to go through like, you know, a box or two a week at one point, right? So and 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 I think that, you know, at that point I didn't know any better because yeah. I didn't have the resources to kind of research the ingredients and what's good for me and what's not good for me, you know. But over time I experimented and I'm like, okay, cutting this out it actually makes me feel better, right? Another food choice that I kind of completely stopped consuming is Subway sandwiches. I used to love Subway sandwiches, used to eat them all the time. And it only, and I realized that the bread that they used, I just, it just didn't sit with me. And every time I would eat Subway sandwich, the next day I would just not feel good. I literally just stopped eating Subway sandwiches. So I feel like, you know, what if like this AI just recognized, right? Like with all these sensors that are part of me, right? Like, all these sensors would have to be continuously monitoring my health, right? This AI could just absorb all that information and just tell me like, you know, hey, based on like your last whatever one month data, here's, you know, how you could, be, you know, change your lifestyle for the next month if you want to meet this goal, right? Uh, I might even be able to set like milestones, like, you know, hey, I want to run a marathon in six months. C- create, create a plan for me, but like you also create a plan that keeps me accountable. Maybe the AI assistant will work with me to kind of keep me accountable, you know, and, and nobody else can do that, right? Your friends don't have time. You can hire a personal assistant or personal trainer, but that's going to cost you money too. Um, yeah. So I think this is, this is all exciting stuff, but I think a lot of technology has to kind of coalesce together for this to, this to happen in our life. It's kind of interesting because we look at things like AI and VR as these things that are kind of fake and artificial and they're they're anti-reality. But the way you're talking about now, it almost sounds like AI is bringing us back to reality. I know we're talking about VR, but now we're talking about AI. And for example, maybe virtual reality is a sort of strong word to use, but like say when you're looking at that Subway sandwich or you're looking at a cereal box, in a way you are looking at this illusion, this sort of virtual object that's been painted over with layers of um, maybe augmented reality is a better word. This is healthy. Oh, this is real. This is natural. This is a yeah. real berry or whatever. Um, yeah. And we think that we're eating something because uh, it looks like something. It looks like food. Uh, yeah. or, or we're uh, doing this or that and we think, oh, this is good for me. And it's some illusion that we've somehow been sold or we've been led to believe. And it's just it's just as virtual or fake or whatever you want to call it as... Um, anything inside the headset, maybe even even more. So with AI, hopefully, it seems the way it's going, it's, it's just collecting the hard data, and this, these are the facts, and we're going to package these together for you, and this is the, this is the reality of the situation. These are numbers and uh, things. Not always, yeah. but um, probably more reliable than what we are seeing through our eyes and thinking through our brain, because that's all tied up to a lot of other... Um, VR providers, uh, AKA, AKA, I don't know, big pharma, a big agra, um, all these other things, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so that's kind of strange, but interesting how in some weird sense, technology can bring us closer to reality. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I certainly believe that this next generation of technology certainly has the capacity to do that because uh, it will do a lot of curation for us. We won't have to sift through thousands of terabytes of information. It will curate things for us, you know, almost act, like I said, acting as your assistant to be like, okay, you know what? But also curate us, curate the information for us, not for the sake of like putting us in the, on this island in the bubble. It will also, ha- will also have the potential to give us a perspective. Maybe, you know, there's a podcast, a, a chat, uh, you know, you may not agree on, right? A, a certain policy, government policy that you may not agree on. 
it won't just filter that out for you. It will actually give you that, you know, hey, this was the policy de- policy decision that was made at the government level. Here's how this impacts you. Here's how it impacts society. I know this doesn't agree with you, but, you know, this is the unanimous decision that was made by a lot of people and they are in agreement. So it'll, it'll almost like it'll also serve as a way to give you perspective. And I feel like that's going to be important in this next, you know, 10 years for us because that's what's missing in the world. People are getting siloed because people are not able to understand each other. People are not able to understand that everybody thinks, feels, and behaves differently based on, you know, where they are in their consciousness journey, right? And I can't judge or doubt or, you know, tell anybody uh, that they are not living the right life because who am I to say that they're not living the right way, right? Um, So I think a lot of this tech is definitely going to help us become better humans. I hope so. And in fact, talking about, you know, grocery stores and cereal and all that, one of the ideas that I had, and I'm just going to put this out in, into the open, hoping that somebody else builds on it, was uh, what if you eventually have your AR glasses with you, you go to a grocery store, uh, and you're just wearing these AR glasses, and it marks all these like various sections into the grocery store as like green zones versus red zones. And what I mean by that is, if a block, an area of the grocery store is marked as green zone, that's actually good for you. You can go there. There's going to be no, you know, bad ingredients of food or whatever in that area. You can buy whatever you want in that green zone because, you know, it's going to be good for you. And then you also have this red zones. Like, well, if you every now and then want to binge on, you know, some high sugary treat, yeah, you can definitely do that. But just be mindful that you're entering this red zone and it's not going to be so I feel like the, you know these sort of things are going to come about our way, and it's going to be super exciting. It's going to make people you know make healthier, better choices in their lives, and and yeah, just overall improve uh, human condition. Dude, even beyond that, AR augmented reality glasses can kind of act as a sort of a ad blocker for reality. Um, currently, uh, we have ad blockers on our on our uh, computers and stuff on our internet. Yeah. But like, what if you walk up to that cereal box and like the the packaging and the designs like just Boom! It's just deleted yeah. and it's replaced with like something like uh, poison or something on top of it or <laughs> whatever. Or you go over to like the the broccoli or something, and it's yeah. like it start. It's like transformed into like a a beautiful goddess or something. You're like oh, yeah. you know, and it's like showing you what is this thing really? Or it's uh, it's showing you how you can feel. I don't know. It's like just basically like an ad blocker or kind of a uh, a booster to to highlight. Oh wow! So even on the individual object level, that'll be yeah. insane. Uh, that would be really cool. I love that. And not just yeah. food, but like everything. <laughs> everything, right? You're incentivizing good behavior change and, you know, you're kind of punishing, you know, bad behavior. But again, uh, guilty here. I Every now and then I would binge on some ice cream. I love ice cream. I can't, you know, stop eating ice cream. Ah, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I, you know, it's, it's one of these things, right? Like I think regulation is key. Uh, you can't go to the extreme end of either way. I think, you know, as as Buddha often says, the middle path is where you find all the answers. So I think if you if you're regulated in uh, your thinking, your feeling, and behave, behaviors, things are gonna you know be easy and not easy. Things are still gonna be hard, but things are gonna you know not hurt as much because, uh, as they say, you know, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional, right? Yeah. Um, and as long as it's not some kind of like addictive or uh, long-term harmful uh, habit or something, maybe your body is seeking out that ice cream for a reason or you're seeking out the this supposedly bad thing for a reason. Because what happens, I've noticed too, is like you try to be too healthy and that kind of bites you in the butt sometimes. You think, oh, this is not good for me. You think you know what's good for you and what's bad for you. And so you just cut off this thing that's bad for you. But as a result, you're lacking a certain nutrient or whatever. Um, Recently, I had sort of this... Um, kind of peripheral neuropathy kind of thing going on my foot. So I get these little like electrical tings, tingle kind of things in my foot. And it just happened for a week or two. And I was like, oh God, what's going on? So I just, I buckled down and started experimenting, like cut out the sugar. I go to the hot spring. And one thing I changed recently, I realized, dude, I have not been eating meat for a long time. Or And then eggs went up in, pr- in, 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 in price. So I kind of stopped eating eggs because oh, they kind of got priced out of the game or whatever. And I think in Maybe I had a, some vitamin B deficiencies or I had a protein deficiency. Yeah. And after adding in some some of that chicken and stuff, which I thought, oh, meat is 
uh, factory farm is not good for you. It's better to be just plants and stuff. Maybe that's true, but that's an extreme. And once I added that meat in, I haven't had any problems uh, since then. And I can't say that's a, it. Might have been the hot spring. It might have been me sleeping better. It could have been. I, I I changed a lot of variables. I've like, guy, we got. I don't want to be like uh, leg. I don't want to be disabled or something. You start you start right. freaking out, thinking, oh, this is the end. Mm, goodbye, legs. Well, yeah. uh, you imagine yourself in a wheelchair and stuff, and like, right. oh, and like, <laughs> so I'm like, no, no, no. So, um, but my point is like, yeah, um. I mean, chicken's not the worst thing, but you know, some people can get really extreme in their um in their vision of what's healthy and what's unhealthy. And maybe that ice cream has some saturated fat or something that you think is bad, but your body needs just a little bit. You know, yeah. I'll say for like lacking magnesium, for example, that's a, a responsible for like hundreds of maybe even a thousand bodily processes. You take that ingredient out, five hundred companies shut down inside your body. It's like boom. And, Things to, the economy doesn't work, you know. Yeah, but you add yeah. that thing in, oh, system starts running. So, yeah, we need to listen to our body. Um, if you can get some gain some sensitivity, and you're being reasonable with it, your body's pushing you, and you're craving certain things for a reason. Um, yeah, we can get addicted to some of these um, Doritos or something. Maybe don't listen to the pure dopamine. But if you take if the body craves, it pushes you into sort of this craving to to eat something, and then afterwards you actually feel good afterwards well maybe it was it's it's pushing you in a in a in the right direction but of course if it uh if you're craving something and your body's telling you go 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 here and you immediately afterwards you feel bad well, okay well can't trust that signal but it's uh, right. learning how to sync up our the signals with the what's actually good for us right yeah yeah and i think that that's where a lot of these um tooling can potentially help us right because it's like you know as you said, you you run a lot of experiments, right, <laughs> to to help you know kind of find the source of your condition. Um, so you did a lot of the numbers crunching and data crunching yourself, right, in your in your mind, um, and that your human brain can never do that kind of crunching, right? We we don't have that kind of capacity, but the AI could, can, right? We have a lot more other capacity than the that the AI doesn't, but you know, you give AI like ten terabytes of information and it'll potentially pull out a lot of insights and wisdom from that information. You give that same 10 terabytes of information to a human, they'll go crazy, right? Um, so I think there's certain things that AI is going to be really good at, in fact, you know, for stuff like this, right? And I think, you know, the, the immersive part, kind of coming back, bringing this back to VR or AR, it's just mixed reality in general. I think it just kind of allows you to have a bit more play in your life, in my opinion. I feel like that's what's missing out in the world where we're all also working on these 2D computer screens, right? Well, what if like your task management system, whatever app you use, was gamified in augmented reality? What if like every time you finish something, you get to crumble up that task and then throw it in you know, the bin in, in an AR environment? Suddenly your body and your mind is going to be like, oh, this is fun. I, I like fun. Let, let's do more of this. You'll be more productive as a result of that. So I feel like a lot of these use cases are going to, you know, come about our way, um, you know, especially in this mixed reality domain. So Yeah, or I had this idea, like what if when you complete a certain task uh, or whatever, it starts building this beautiful world for you, like your mountains getting taller. You know, I love this game called uh, Harvest Moon. I used to play that game a lot. It was fun. Mm -hmm. and you're kind of building your farm and you're getting your cows and you're getting your wife and you're building this life. And what if like by completing certain tasks in real life well, it, or in VR, basically, because we're that's, that becomes real life, um, you, uh, I don't know, you could do, and the AI knows like kind of how you work. Oh, you, right. you like this kind of thing. So, um, Maybe it's like builds this, it's a kind of world builder and it builds this beautiful, like, I don't know, a natural environment or whatever it is that you want. You're like, ooh, I want to make a yeah. taller mountain. I want to get a little, I want to add a little, uh, uh, extra little room to my house. Oh, well, it's like Sim, it's like Sim City. Yeah. But we meet productivity and all that. And like, well, it'd be super cool. I would love to play that game. I think we all would. But we you all get the definitely. work done, get the work done, it. and then you can get the, uh, these virtual yeah, rewards. The benefits. Yeah, that's the that's the key part, right? And I think there has to be some mechanisms in place to check if you did actually get your work done, right? It's I mean, it's like it's like you can cheat anything these days. Uh, same thing like with workouts, right? Like what if like you'd, you could have this beautiful world created, you know, if you work out a certain number of times a week, right? Uh, you yeah. can apply that to anything. But 
but certain things you can fake, right? Like when people used to have these, what, Fitbit competitions, the, the number of steps challenge, they used to attach Fitbits to their pets and then win these competitions because the pet just kept them moving. Um, so there's always ways that hum- human, humans will look for like hacks, but I think technology is going to get smarter. And uh, at some point, we may not be able to outsmart, uh, you know, and, and it might actually be, be better for us because you can't hack your way into good health. I think good health and well-being requires effort. Um, productivity requires effort and focus. Um, and I think you you give people the tools that you know allow them to be focused and, and practice better well-being, and then suddenly you're you know you're helping them in their lives. And we're using uh, we have certain tools that we like to use to to feel like we're getting better. Um, money is one tool we can easily use. Like, oh, I'll just, I'll just buy my way into this or that. Um, yeah. I I think this this thing we're talking about now which is this fun fun little tangent we're getting on is. Even like uh, the things, these things we normally pay for, maybe you don't pay with money, but you pay with work. For example, maybe dating applications, for example, instead of paying uh, whatever, 20 bucks a month for it, is you go to the gym and you earn credits to be able to talk to these girls or whatever, because you you worked out or um, uh, maybe instead of paying for your phone bill, you uh, it goes back to, it's kind of like a Black Mirror kind of episode, but yeah. you're exercising or you're, um, you create a kind of project that, uh, somehow aligns with these larger goals of helping the world or whatever. And by by getting that work done, maybe it's writing that book or maybe it's making a podcast. I don't know how, how helpful it has to be for everyone, but maybe by getting your work done even that is meaningful to you. Uh, and maybe the money's coming out of your bank account or something. Maybe it hooks up and like it blocks access to your own money, but maybe the money's, com- money's coming from these... Um, these organizations or corporations who are trying to help the world and help people get better. I don't know where the money's come from or the government, the government, that'd be a good use of government money. I think is to encourage people to do healthy things. And yeah. then by being in these virtual worlds and we're doing these things, you're getting sort of these credits. You're either, you're building a world like a, just for beauty and like, Oh, this is my stuff. Or maybe it's giving you real life things like, Oh, you're now you have access to these um, potential dating opportunities or these, uh, uh, health insurance opportunities. Oh, now you get sort of, uh, you get this free health insurance or whatever. Um, yeah. That's so super cool. A whole new way of uh, how money and all that stuff can work. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree. I think I think um, we're all used to a world where free healthcare, right, uh, is not really free, as, as I'm sure you know. Um, there is a cost somewhere, right? And But I think, I think, I always say this, uh, people are just as much responsible for their health as much as systems are, right? So hospitals are definitely responsible uh, to take care of you when you do enter into that system. But you have just enough, res- just as much responsibility. You can't just like, you know, I, 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 I can't treat my body like a, like a vehicle. I can't just like, you know what, I, I'm not going to take care of my vehicle. I'll just get a, a repairment of car guy a mechanic to fix it right i i wish we could do that with our bodies but we can't and i think that shift needs to happen internally where you need to recognize that you are just as much responsible for taking care of this vehicle which is your body and your mind and your spirit um as much as you know potentially the government is or the doctor is or your school system is or your workplaces and i think until and unless people learn that that they pay uh, you know they ha- they have to be an equal contributor to their own well-being. Um, sure. Otherwise, it'll always be lopsided and they'll always be unhappy because like, oh, they didn't they didn't give me this benefit. Like, well, they will give you that benefit, but what did you do to actually get better, mm-hmm. right? You know, so. How you keep unveiling all these new aspects of yourself and all these new ideas. I'm like, oh, there's, just, there's new stuff to talk about. I like these notes of things we could talk about and we're like, oh, and I, I know you got to go pretty soon, but uh, oh man, this, this is great. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, I just, I just threw myself off there. Yeah. Oh yeah. The, uh, mechanical kind of, uh, repair shop model of human health. Um, I, I do want to touch on that. Uh, we, I don't know when it happened, but now we have this idea that we are like some kind of car, broken car or broken computer or whatever. And we go into the shop to get fixed or, uh, and they give us some medicine or they do a little, do a little trick on us and they, and they bring us back to health. And oftentimes it's not even it's just getting rid of the symptom or something. And it, yeah. and we, and they, and they, you have to, in Japan is especially, 
uh, nut, pretty nutty because it's so specialized. If if you go to the doctor, uh, they ask you, well, well, what's wrong with you? Well, I, I was like, well, I don't know. I'm feeling this. Well, they're like, well, which part and stuff? I'm like, oh. And they have to send you to some different ho- different office for each little part of the uh, machine. Body, right, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And they don't even know which part it is. So you have to go figure out which which part of my machine is broken. And it's like, oh, it's, it's a system problem. Um, but um, yeah, can you talk about some of the, I don't know, harmful uh, or illusory effects of this uh, machine model of the world and this sort of mechanical uh, fix it, uh, yeah, broken yeah. kind of model of human health. Uh, this is we'll try to finish up soon, but yeah, yeah, no, this is this is very interesting for me because I've always wanted to talk. To, you know, I always talk to people about this model because here's the reality: many many years ago, let's say two three decades ago, right, human health um a lot of people got sick a lot of people got hurt a lot of people got you know got into accidents right just as much as today but the reality is um if you look at the graph of the number of chronic conditions over the last you know and its progression over the last like 20 30 40 years it has gotten worse and and what do you mean by something you know that's chronic right it literally translates to something that is not acute. What, do you, what does it mean to be having an acute condition? Well, when you're walking down the street and a motorbike rams into you and you break a bone, that's a very acute condition. You have to go to the hospital. They ha- you have to get treated by a doctor who specializes in a broken bone, right? Whether it's a broken knee, you'll get a doctor who will specialize in broken knee and will fix you up or send you home, right? You, you, uh, you know, you're, Right, driving your car and you again just you know run into run into somebody and and your heart you know kind of has an issue suddenly you get to the doc the hospital they'll treat you for a heart condition that's fine these are all acute conditions that you know you, you things happen you know we can't pr- protect ourselves at all given times you get you know hurt or you get sick or you get infected by a virus that's totally fine you get better and then you're fine but chronic conditions are conditions that are perpetually there with you, right? The, the kind of the underlying current with you. It's like a lot of, you know, type 2 diabetes, right? A lot of cancers, um, a lot of like, you know, uh, uh, hypertension, like blood pressure. All these like conditions are lifestyle diseases. These are chronic conditions that are caused not because of an acute event. They're caused because, you know, of some thinking you know, uh, distortion or feeling distortion or behavior distortion in your system, right? And these can't be treated like a mechanical, you know, uh, body shop, right? So I think that's what I, I you know, want to share with the world that you can't treat chronic conditions, you know, like you treat, uh, you know, these acute conditions. And I think chronic conditions requires doctors to look at your life holistically and not just the body part. And treat the whole person and not just that individual part, because that individual part might be uh, a downstream effect of something that's happening upstream, right? Um, so that's that's what I have to say about that. And I think I think that we are getting there to that point where our medical systems are realizing that fact. Um, but I feel I feel like we're still kind of far behind because of um, of decades of. Uh, training that doctors went through to look at the human body as, as just these, you know, parts that are stuck together. So what are some basic uh, things that people could do in general to sort of combat that themselves? Cause right now it's kind of on us. We need to take responsibility over our own, over our own health because the healthcare yeah. system isn't going to do it. The government's not going to do it. We can't wait for yeah. someone. We can't take this sort of victim mentality. We just got to be like, okay. Um, one, I think we got to believe in the power of our, the self healingness of our body, that our body, if you give it the right stuff, it, it's it's going to try to try to get yeah. you there. But um, yeah, before we finish up, just what are some uh, some of your basic? Uh, you, you mentioned some before about the getting the sunlight. Uh, but <laughs> while we are talking about uh, VR and technology and stuff, um, because you are sort of this wealth of knowledge about uh, your, you, you called yourself a uh, what you call it a, a, a brain health aficionado. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, g- give us some of your kind of uh, just basic just basic uh, tips on how to improve our brain health and all that. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's pretty simple. I think one of the first things you can do is, um, 
I'll, I'll split this up into different categories. The first thing is, you know, movement. Movement is absolutely important. Move around, you know, get your body moving a little bit every day, right? That's absolutely important. Second is sleep. Sleep is huge. If you do, if you do nothing for your mental well-being, just just sleep. Sleep at least, you know, whatever, seven, eight hours, just and get good deep sleep, right? Um, third thing is like, you know, stress reduction. I think we we all expose ourselves to these stressors, um, not by choice or because we like to experience stress, because the nature of our work, the nature of living in this world, you know, impinges certain stressors on you. If I have to go and walk to the grocery store and there's like snow outside, that's that's going to cause a little bit of stress on my functioning, right? That's okay. That's normal. Just have a better... Uh, like, you know, better tools to regulate your stress uh, on an everyday basis that's sustainable. I think that's the key part. Don't just rely on like, you know, uh, just alcohol or anything. Like it's, 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 and, and yeah, it's, the, the last part is like alcohol, right? Like it's just, I think there was a report that was recently published that said no amount of alcohol is actually good for you, right? This whole tr- mindset of like a little bit of wine with dinner every day is, is good for you. Technically, the research has shown that no amount of alcohol is actually good for you, right? So I think, yeah, movement, sleep, take care of, you know, your, your stress, uh, food, and, and you know, having a regulated kind of consumption of good, healthy food. Um, yeah, these are the four or five things I recommend. And I think if you do this, you're pretty much ahead of most people in the world because most people are not even able to do a few of these things. And you might be able to heal yourself. I don't want to say, oh, you, we can heal everything, but you can you can make everything better really just by doing those things. So I, w- I was talking about how, um, yeah, I'm a bit sensitive. Maybe I'm a hypochondriac. I don't know. But like I get this little kind of like tiny little electric bolts in my foot. And I think a lot of people actually have this kind of thing uh, in, in America, sort of peripheral neuropathy because the nervous system runs. It's a whole electricity system through a whole yeah. body. It's not just a central nervous system of our brain, our spinal cord and our um uh, vagus nerve and all that, but like it goes all the way. It's everywhere. Every it's touch, yeah. you know? Yeah. And what I, I'm, I was trying to think of what's going on. What did I change recently? And one thing is I went on this weird kind of, uh, I was going out with this coworker and we go out drinking a lot this past, uh, not recently, but before that happened and, um, drinking and drinking and drinking. I don't even like drinking, but you know, you get in these sort of parts of life. And, uh, I, I, I think maybe, have drinking all that alcohol caused some some of those problems you know and this is one of the causes of people to get say kind of a peripheral neuropathy which is basically sort of that numbness or tingling or pain yeah. in your usually your feet starting in your feet because that's where we have a lot of our sensors right. um and alcohol one it uh it depletes all these essential nutrients uh, these b vitamins and things like that it's hot it raises your blood sugar which is anytime you raise your blood sugar that's gonna um cause nerve damage and brain damage and it's going to uh, damage all your cells, really. But if you have too much um, sugar, too much alcohol, alcohol is just it's a toxin. It's, it's breaking things. Yeah. So um, I don't know. Once I cut the alcohol out, I started sleeping. I started eating real food. I started making sure I was eating the whole rainbow of nu- nutrients and not just eating the same thing every day because I thought this is the thing to eat. Yeah. Um, go, getting on sunlight, you know, today I woke up at, uh, we were talking at 5 a.m. my time and while you think you might think, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, thank you, because that uh, this is when you're supposed to wake up, wake up with the sun, um, mm-hmm. and go to sleep, uh, you know, at a reasonable time, whatever feels right for you. Uh, I did all these things. Um, added in some chlorella. I think maybe there's some sort of a got to detox something. So I was just taking some chlorella to maybe wash something out, and maybe knock on wood. I hope it's gone, but I, I, even if not, it's, it's better. It's better. And that's the same thing. So if you have diabetes, you've got um, schizophrenia, anything. Yeah, I'm not, we're not, you can't say that all these things are going to just cure you and make you uh, quote unquote normal or back to health, but it's going to most likely improve things. And if it doesn't, um, try something else. But we don't need to just, re- just rely on the doctors to fix us. We can. Uh, no. no, we need to take ownership. And I think, I think uh, that is something that's going to be absolutely needed. And I think people are, will only be able to take ownership when you give them tools that will give them the knowledge and the wisdom, right? Ultimately, there's a lot of information out there. 
but there isn't a lot of knowledge and there isn't a lot of wisdom. And I think what most humans, most of us are not capable to sift through thousands of petabytes of information and then synthesize all that into you know knowledge bytes and perhaps even wisdom bytes. And I think um, technology can help us do that to a certain extent. So yeah. Before we finish up, we haven't directly talked about your company. I I gave my little uh, paragraph about it, but I may or may not be correct about it. So can you give us um, some basic information about what you and your company does? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so so uh, Novo Being, which used to be called Rocket VR Health, uh, we just went through a little bit of a rebrand. Um, our vision is to create a world where immersive well-being is available for anyone, anywhere. And what I mean by that is, you know, we, we want to take these existing clinically validated approaches to better mental well-being, such as CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, acceptance, commitment therapy, positive psychology, affirmations, visualization. And we want to blend that with the immersive powers of virtual reality to bring you improved well-being at scale. So this is something that we've been working on for the last uh, three years. Uh, we're actually clinically validating a lot of our approaches with partnerships with hospital systems in the U.S. and Canada. We currently have four active ongoing clinical trials, one in Boston, one in Philadelphia, one in uh, Memphis, and then one in, uh, in Calgary, Canada. And then we, may, we might have a couple more uh, begin as well. But again, the idea here is we're building effectively what's, what we call the future of well-being. Uh, the future of well-being is absolutely immersive. Um, and yeah, we just want to create a world where these tools and technologies are available for people to access at a much lower price point than traditional therapy, which sometimes can be just unengaging and, and um, not as not as fun. Um, and we want to have people a choice, right? At the end of the day, we all know what pharmaceutical drugs are doing to us. Uh, and I'm not saying they're all bad, but I think uh, reliance on it, it completely is bad. Um, so yeah, so we're just building these tools to make you know immersive well-being more accessible and better for people. Um, yeah, that's a little bit about Nova Bing. And you're mostly working with hospitals, right? Can individuals uh, access this? And if not, what are some of your recommended VR or non-VR experiences mm -hmm. that can do something similar? Yeah, so we literally this week launched a consumer version of our product. So if you have access to a VR headset, and uh, we're officially on the SideQuest App Store. So you should be able to just search in the SideQuest App Store for Novo Being, and you'll be able to find it. Or you can just sign up at uh, novobeing.com. There's an early access link. And every, anybody who signs up uh, this month, we're actually giving free lifetime access to the consumer version of the app um, before we you know, have some sort of a, a, a subscription behind it. But yeah, we what we're doing is we're learning a lot of lessons from our clinical deployments and we're extracting out, you know, non-clinical versions or non-clinical uh, experiences uh, from that and then bringing that out into the consumer world. But we'll still have a um, clinical grade version of our digital therapeutics and we'll also have a non-clinical grade uh, version that everybody can use. Okay, so that's so novobeing.com, N L V O. B-E-I-N-G dot com, right? Yeah, that's correct. And I'll put all this in the show notes and add all the other links to things we've talked about and stuff. Um, thank you so much, Sid, for uh, this amazing conversation. I love these conversations, especially being in Japan, where uh, if there's a communication uh, issue. I can't even have normal conversations with a lot of people. Um, this is really um, great for me, and I hope it is for a lot of the people listening. Um, I hope we can t talk again. Yeah. Uh, continue this again sometime because, um, dude, I can talk to you forever. You're you're my you're my brother in this kind of thing. It's like, yeah, we are. <laughs> and I, I think there are more and more people, uh, you know, uh, becoming uh, interested in all of this. So that's a great thing. The more the merrier. So podcasts like this, like Andrew Huberman's uh, Huberman Lab, um, and there are others. Are there any other podcasts that you you think? Oh, these are really great. Of course, Huberman Lab is like a, a must. Any others? Yeah. You know, to be honest, I don't. I don't listen to a lot of podcasts unless like they come recommended. Uh, Andrew okay. Huberman, like, you know, I, I watch his clips. It, it There's just so much content out there. Right. And, and a lot, and a lot of it, believe it or not, is basically just a re regurgitation of what's know, already man. exists. Right. And I feel like, yeah. you know, okay, we're basically, you know, saying the same thing in 10 different ways. Yes. And a lot of times, you know, I, I just like to have 
you know, I read, I read books. I think I, I rely more on that. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, so I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a guy to, <laughs> for yeah. any podcast recommendations, like, but about, I definitely, uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe med- just meditate. You just, just sit there in silence and uh, get to, in this open space. That might teach you more than a podcast. Cause yeah, the podcast is even books, movies, or it's just rep- repetition, repetition. Have you found any, um, any great books recently on this topic? Uh, some things that, whoa, this is going to help a lot of people uh, across yeah. the board and saying something yeah. new, not just repeating the same stuff in the past 20 years. Yeah. So I think, I think definitely why Buddhism is true is the one that I highly recommend. Um, it, it, it really kind of provided me with a framework, you know, um, on how to look at the world. And I think that another one that I recently stumbled upon, and this is an old one, I believe it's called the enlightened brain. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think I have it on my shelf somewhere. Yeah. The enlightened brain. I forget the name of the author, but I'm sure, um, you'll be able to find the author just by looking at uh, the name yeah it looks like it's rick hansen wow uh, but I'll, I'll i'll add that to the show notes too it might be a different that might be a different book sometimes you got 12 books with the same title but uh, <laughs> uh anyway yeah we can keep going on forever so uh thank you and hope to uh connect with your brilliant brain again soon yeah absolutely <laughs> well michael thank you so much for waking up this early in the time and yeah definitely um when i'm in japan i'll let you know yeah thanks and you're in boston right i am all right. All right. So, near Boston. Um, okay, cool. Uh, yeah. Thanks. And uh, yeah. See you around. <laughs> all right. Have a good day, Michael. You too. Bye. Bye. After this conversation, the first thing I did was I rushed over to NovoBeing.com and snagged up my free lifetime subscription to NovoBeing. Wow. It's got breathwork and meditation sessions, all kinds of cool, beautiful VR worlds to go through to reduce your stress. Oh my God, I'm so excited for this. And even if you don't have a VR headset, most likely someday you will. So get this deal while it's still there. And if not, if you're listening to this in the future, then just message me. Uh, I'm sure we could talk to Sid and work out some sweet special deal. Right, Sid? Hook it up. Hook it up. Give us a deal. We love deals. Yes, we do. But more than that, we love our health. So take care of yourself.